but yeah, I'm a really excited to to do this today. <clears throat> this has actually been something I've wanted to do for for quite a while was to like take this presentation and try to just record it somehow just because yeah, when I first wanted to do this one, there seemed to be like a lot of questions around this and a lot of uh, a lot of people wanted like some general information on this which was or isn't always the easiest to find. So today is the best day I think to do this. So yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, hopefully people will come and, and have questions. If you do have questions, like don't hesitate to to ask it all. Um, I plan on this being like a, quite a bit more informal than the last time I gave these talks just because, yeah, like now I'm in front of my computer and I don't have like a time constraint and I can show examples or do whatever. So I'm pretty excited to to do it this way. So uh, yeah, but let's uh, let's dive in right away. And again, if you have questions or anything, don't hesitate to ask. And if, like if it fits in the moment, I'll try to address it. Or if not, at the end, we can dive into like specific questions about whatever things you may have. But uh, for those of you that have maybe like never joined before and never been here, just a little bit about myself. I'm a software engineer at Lunatech. I'm a big NeoVim fam, if you, if you haven't figured that out yet, because like all of my stuff is in NeoVim. Uh, but I really like enjoy, I really enjoy working on tooling. Uh, I'm one of the current metals maintainers, and then I'm the author of like some of the Vim specific stuff in metals as well. Uh, and if you do, like I'll post these slides afterwards too, in case anybody like has or wants to like go back and, and, and look at them. Um, but right away, like before I get started at all, and like every time I talk about metals, I always want to try to, at least more recently, like focus on Scala Meta, because I feel like it's one of those things that like all of metals and a lot of other tools in the Scala ecosystem rely on, but it kind of just like floats underneath the radar and not as many people are aware of it. But if you're not aware, metals is actually part of like a larger family of tooling underneath Scala Meta. So like if you're familiar with Scala format, uh, MDoc or MUnit or just Scala Meta itself, which like all of these things basically rely on in some way or another. Um, it's a whole family of tooling. So like I have appreciated being part of this organization so much and learned a ton. Uh, and I think all of the tools are, are fantastic. So check out some of the other stuff if you're unfamiliar with some of the things you see on the screen there. Uh, but yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff that Scala Meta does, not just not just metals. And ironically, actually, like the metals logo isn't isn't actually the metals logo. It's the Scala Meta logo. So fun little fact. Uh, hello from Poland. Hi. Uh, also, I also don't want to talk about like anything with metals without like mentioning like basically the people that have like laid the foundation and continue to because there has been like a ton of effort that has gone into both metals and everything else that it relies on from all over the place. So uh, if you are unfamiliar with some of these names, I just want to like bring attention to a little a few of them. So like Olaf and Gabriella were sort of the two that pioneered metals and really got everything started and like laid the groundwork for what it is today. Uh, Tomek from Virtus Labs in the middle there has kind of like in the last almost like two years already have sort of just been like steering the ship forward continuously and then also doing a ton of other stuff in the ecosystem. Uh, then Vadim as well has done like a ton of work on Scala Meta and Metals as well. So when you think of Metals, think of all these people and then a whole bunch more that I'm not even going to attempt to name because I will totally miss some people that have done like a tremendous amount of work. And I also try to like point out other tools during this talk that we rely on or that we do stuff with because like metals is really like a conglomeration of like a whole bunch of different tooling that sort of all comes together in one place and like you interact with metals but in reality you're interacting with a whole bunch of stuff so where it makes sense i'll try to like point point out where that stuff is but the whole point of like what i wanted to do today was talk about this image and it was actually really funny because I was putting together a talk about metals and this was not the focus of the talk. And I made this slide and I posted it on Twitter and people were like, yes, do a talk on that. And that was like not the point of what I was planning on doing the talk about, just like one small little picture of it. Uh, but then I like sort of just scrapped the idea and decided to just like do an entire talk on this image basically. And the more I've like talked about this or the more I've thought about it or work on metals in general, the more I like, I'm starting to be just like a firm believer that I think like the majority of the stuff in this image, I wish like nobody could like, you didn't even have to care about. Like I, I really do think like a ton of it should almost be just like abstracted away. And like, you could just open your editor and start editing Scala and whatever is working underneath the hood just works and you don't need to worry about it. And I sort of think that's like the dream come true. Um, but I also know that that's always not the case. Like sometimes things go wrong and then when things go wrong, uh, then you try to ask questions about like what's actually happening under the hood or like what what tool is actually doing this 
um and then like the the borders get off blurry and like you don't know what is doing what uh and then that's really helpful to like have a graph like this and start to understand what things are going on so my goal for today is to literally just explain this graph there's even more arrows and more protocols that we'll go over that aren't on here um, but by the end of it i hope that if you've like made it through the entire talk that you'll have like a much much better understanding of like what's going on and how things are working together and we'll start of go step by step and everything will build off the other one as well so if you're unfamiliar which i don't know if anybody here is or not but like what is metals first of all metals is a scala language server uh, with rich ide features is what i think we say on the website um, provides language features like autocomplete, go to definition, find references, basically like all the things you want out of your editor when you open it up and you want language support, like all IntelliSense, all just navigation errors and extra doodads and different things like that. It works with any editor that knows LSP, more or less we'll say, just because there are like varying levels of support with different editors, just because Metals, Metals does actually like have a pretty significant set of metal specific endpoints uh, and you can kind of extend LSP with your own server specific endpoints and we make use of that um, and then also not all LSP clients will support even the full range of LSP so there are certain parts of the LSP spec that we rely on pretty heavily that if you are an editor that doesn't support that feature set then it gets kind of tricky um, but I mentioned LSP before I was supposed to, so LSP, uh, if you're unfamiliar with this term, we'll, we'll, we'll like briefly touch on it because you can do like an entire talk on this as well. Um, but I just want to go over like what is LSP because without and like at least a base understanding of LSP, like metals will make no sense. So before we even talk about what it is, we sort of need to talk about the problem that it addresses. And I feel like if you've watched like any talk on metals ever, like you'll see a similar diagram to this. But the general idea of LSP is that you have a whole bunch of editors and you have a whole bunch of languages. And what happens when you need to add support for every one of those languages to every one of those editors? And like the graph is actually larger than this as well, right? So you have just like, even just for a single language, you have a ton of effort that is put into editor support for that language for every editor if you didn't have something like LSP. LSP aims to sort of like alleviate this problem by having like a shared set of like a shared protocol. So right from like the Microsoft docs is the idea behind the language server protocol is to standardize the protocol for how tools and servers communicate for a single language server that can be reused in multiple development tools and tools can support languages with minimal effort. So the idea is if you're coming from Java and you uh, well, more than likely you're an IntelliJ, but not necessarily. So let's say you're a NeoVim JDTLS user, you love NeoVim, you love JDTLS, and you want to try out Scala. The idea shouldn't be, oh man, now I have to like jump into a different editor, learn that editor in order to learn that too. No, you can stay in whatever editor you want, whatever one you're comfortable with, and you can jump into that new language and the language server will support you. So that's, that's the idea behind it. And if you're unfamiliar with like how it works underneath the hood, you don't really need to know a ton, but the idea is that there's a bunch of JSON RPC messages that are firing back and forth from your server to your clients or from whatever tool it is. And if you look at the example here, you can kind of see a flow, right? So like you did open is you opening a document, you changed the document. So then a did change notification is sent to the server. Then maybe the server does some compilation stuff and sends back some diagnostics. And then you ask for a definition request and then it sends back the definition and, and so on. And then right at the end you close. So you call sort of see like the whole life cycle of different things that you're doing in your editor which is back and forth communication from the server to the clients okay and here are a couple like real examples from metals so like the top one is just like a message like you'll notice a lot of times you'll see like a little status bar in the bottom of your editor and it'll say like compiling root two seconds or something and that that's what this is coming from when we publish diagnostics, uh, here's an example where we are like sending a published diagnostics notification, but there are no di diagnostics. So this is useful sometimes when you want to clear diagnostics. So that's why that's here. Uh, then just like another log message. So you can kind of see how this works. 
So, so far, so, so, so good, pretty simple. You have a client and you have a server and you have some LSP communication going back and forth. Uh, I also try to do my best, like during this whole time or talk, there'll be like certain uh, images that you can replace like with whatever you want, with whatever you want, basically. So like I use NeoVim, so NeoVim is here. But if you're like an Emacs user, just stick Emacs here. VS Code, stick VS Code. Like any editor that speaks LSP, you can basically stick into that slot and that's and it will work the same. Um, and I'll do my, there will be like a few different cases where you can kind of like swap things out for other things. And I'll like let you know when those things are. So pretty simple, LSP. Cool. So then probably the very first question you will have and a lot of people ask is like, so Metals then compiles my code. Like that will go off that assumption. No, not really actually. And Metals doesn't compile any of your code. It kind of... But before we answer that question, we have, again, this matrix problem that we need to address. Uh, so like, let's just simplify it to you only have two options for Scala. And in, in reality, like these are basically like your two options if you're going to get started with Scala today. You have Metals and your editor of choice, or you have IntelliJ. But then you have SPT, Gradle, Bazel, Maven, Mill, Bloop, like whatever build tool that you commonly use. Now we have the same problem all over again, where the idea is like, well, do we introduce sort of an integration with every one of these build tools? And then the folks at IntelliJ are also going to create an integration for every one of these build tools. And in reality, there's not a whole bunch of people that are just solely working on tooling. Like there are people that solely work on tooling, but uh, the amount of duplicated efforts here is is huge just by looking at a graph like this, right? So similar to the idea of LSP, the question arose of how could you simplify something like this? And out of that question basically was the was born the build server protocol, which is a protocol for IDEs and build tools to communicate about compile, run, test, debug, and more. So basically everything related to compiling and running and basically like things that you want to know about trying to compile your code. And the way that this looks in Metals is now, if you remember the graph that we saw before, which I think I can go like this, yeah. Metals was the server and your editor was the client. In this new situation, Metals becomes the client and now you have a server, which is a build server. So in this sense, we'll talk about Bloop, which is the default build server for Metals. And uh, there's, again, RPC JSON communication firing back and forth between Metals and Bloop. Um, about compiling your code. So you can, I think, uh, we'll should give you some examples first. So like uh, BSP communication, again, looks very similar to LSP communication. And in this situation, the request would be going from Metals to your build server saying, give me all of the Scala test classes. And here I have this like example workspace and I give it the URI and I say here, this, this is the build target that I want all the test classes for. So then Bloop will do its thing and it will look in that build target that this URI belongs to and then it will send back an array of classes that are test classes. But in this case, there is none. So it just sends back an empty array. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different stuff that we can ask for. We can ask for test classes, main classes. We can ask you to compile, to, to reload the build definition, a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, but just keep in mind that the communication with BSP between Metals and a build server is pretty similar to the communication between Metals and your and your editor as a LSP. So simplified what everything we've talked about so far. We have your clients, which is your in your sorry your LSP client, which is your editor, speaking LSP with Metals. Uh, then Metals is speaking BSP with the build server. So you can imagine in a situation, you're in your editor, you edit some code, you click save, we send that did save notification to Metals, Metals takes that new code or knows where that what, what new code was just saved, sends that information to BSP to say, hey, this person just uh, like saved this, this file with the, here's some new code. BSP will then compile all that jazz. Uh, and it will say, oh, well, actually, you have some diagnostics. It will send the diagnostics back to Metals. Metals will then forward those diagnostics to your client, and then they pop up in your editor as diagnostics. So that's like the general flow of compiling your code. So Metals actually isn't compiling it. It's offloading it to the BSP server, and then the BSP server is communicating back. I hope this makes sense so far. I feel like this part is like pretty simple, just like a straight line back and forth. But uh, I think it starts to get complicated once we go much further from this point. 
because a question you might have is, okay, how does whatever build server I'm using actually know about my build, right? Because uh, let's say I'm using SPT or whatever else, that's what I code my build definition in, that's what knows my build definition. How does the build server know about that definition? And there's two different situations that we can talk about and that would that basically exist. And the first situation is uh, a possible situation that happens when you're using SPT. Not all the time and not by default, but your build tool can be your build server as well. And you'll have noticed after, if you're an SPT user as of 140, uh, you saw this .bsp directory popping up all the time in your, in your file and like you should have added it to your gitignore. Um, and inside of this, you'll just see a entry for spt.json and according to BSP discovery so we talked a little bit about BSP and the discovery rules of BSP talk about how in this .bsp directory there can be x amount of JSON files that hold the instructions to manage the life cycle of a build server so uh, SPT adds an entry there so when metals looks at this directory it can tell oh SPT can serve as a build server here's the instructions of how to start it and here's the arguments that we need to start it like basically everything we know to start this build server okay situation two is a little bit different so uh, this is a situation where your build server cannot be your build tool and we need to somehow get that information from your build tool to what's called a bloop definition so that bloop knows how to understand it. And uh, you'll also notice a lot of times when you start Meadows, you'll see this dot bloop directory that's created and that's created when this process happens. So in the example of using mill as a build tool, if you execute mill and you say mill bsp bsp install, what it does is it actually takes all the information from mill, uh, from the it gets all the information about the build targets, the and Scala C options, your dependencies, where they're all located, all that jazz, writes it to disk in your dot bloop directory in JSON files. Uh, and then Bloop can now read those JSON files and know the information about your build definition. So, for example, if you have one module called foo, uh, you'll get a foo.json file. You probably also get a foo test.json file to correspond to the build targets that exist by default just by creating a single module. I actually don't know what they are in mill, like what the defaults are, but for example, in SPT, you'll get uh, by default, uh, an, a, a foo and a foo test. And then if you enable IT, for example, for integration tests, you'll also get like a foo IT.json. And that's the three build targets that it knows about. All right. So again, we have situation one where we're using SPT and we choose to also use SPT as a build server. Keep in mind that like uh, this situation is not the default situation. Even if you're using SPT, you are using Bloop. So if you want situation to one to work, you would need to start up metals. Uh, I then do a generate BSP config, which will then generate that dot BSP SPT.json file. Or if you've already started SPT, that file will exist already. Then you could just do a BSP switch command and choose SPT. But uh, you can see here that we have the communication again, going from client to metals, the LSP communication. The BSP going from uh, your from metals to the build server, which in this case is SBT. Uh, then uh, you have sort of a dotted line from metals up to SBT because it knows that you're using SBT. It knows when you change your SBT file. But then there's also like a direct link between like SBT that knows your build definition and SBT that is your build server because they're one and the same. So um, there are some distinct differences in, in this situation versus the next situation. But let me explain the next situation in the graph and then we'll talk really briefly about like the differences between these two. So like here's the other situation. Again, you're using SBT and this is the default one. So Metals has again has like a data line to SBT. It knows that when you change your file, it knows when you save all this jazz and it says, oh, you saved? Cool, you have to import your build again. So that's what happens when you see that pop up. It will run an SBT task. It will get all the stuff out of SBT and write it to disk so then Bloop can read it. And then we talk back and forth from with Bloop. 
Okay, so a couple differences, and like this is a really common question we always get is like, well, which, which one do you use? What one's better? Uh, it's pretty opinionated to be honest, like which one you want to use. But the reason we use Bloop by default is sort of like a historical reason. Just like SPT wasn't a build server when we first when Metals was first started. Uh, also, like S, uh, our entire like testing is basically done with Bloop, so like it's it's tested. It's everything sort of there. Another benefit of it is that. Uh, your entire build definition is written to disk. So like if you jump to a new project that you were in before, there's no server running, for example. Well, in Bloop, like Bloop is sort of always running in the background, um, but there's no like uh, you have not, you don't have that project open. You can sort of open that project. You have an indexing process and you're ready to go. Like you can you can go pretty quickly. And like for myself, like in a single day at work, I might be in like 10, 10 15 different repos. Uh, so I really like the ability to just jump in and out and ha have like quickly get going and like not have to sit there and wait. Um, if you are using SPT as a build server, um, you read the entire build definition into memory before it starts. So it does take a little bit longer. So I actually recommend typically if you are going to use SPT as a build server, start SPT with like SPTN first and then attach to it. And then you could attach right away and it's super fast. Um, and again, then everything is read into memory and the server stays alive for, I, don't, I actually don't remember what the default stay alive time is for SPT, uh, but it'll stay alive for a while, even when you shut down, same as Bloop. Um, so again, it, there's different situations. If you have a very complex SPT build with like a ton of crazy stuff, uh, then sometimes using SPT as your build server is the better option because it has access to like your entire task graph. So where if you do, if you use Bloop, you don't, you sort of just get whatever the export gives you. So it, it really depends on your specific situation. Stays alive for seven days by default. Okay. Yes. Seven days. I literally forget that all the time. I, I also don't remember how to change that. I, I feel like I've asked this question many times before, but, um, yeah, and also also keep in mind too, like the features of them are pretty much the same. So like there's no feature benefit from using one over the other, at least as far as I am aware, because even SPT now offers navigation in your meta build. So like even going to definitions in your SPT files work for both SPT and Bloop, they both support debugging, which we'll go over later. Um, so like they're both feature the same, basically. Again, it, it almost like really depends on like what your build looks like, which one you should use. If you don't know which one to use, just use the default and don't worry about it. So how does Metals then do everything else you might be wondering? Because like everything we talked about so far was basically just about like compiling your code, getting diagnostics and that kind of stuff. So there's a bunch of other stuff that you're probably familiar with uh, or that you wanna know about. Uh, I'll stop. I can answer this question maybe right away. Why does using SPT as a build server fail to create a build server definitions? Uh, create build server definitions. Like why can it not create a SPT, a BSP or a BSP SPT.json file, I'm assuming you mean? Uh, I actually don't know why it shouldn't be able to, because even by default, I think when you start up SPT, it'll create that file unless you have it turned off. So unless I think if you have like a SPT server disabled for a specific build, then I'm assuming it won't actually, or if you have, there's a specific setting that you can also set to not create that file. So I'm assuming if you have one of those set, it won't create it by default, but I, I'm, I'm really not sure why, why it wouldn't. That would be a good question to ask the SPT folks of why can't my build create a, a SPT.json file? So how does it do everything else? So there's basically two large things we'll go over about how Metals does all the other stuff that you would expect it to do, right? The first thing that we'll talk about is the Scala presentation compiler, which uh, the first time I heard this, I literally had no idea what that meant, where it was located, what it does. Like I just, I didn't understand it all. And if, if you're like newer to tooling or to the compilers or anything, like you read something like this and it makes zero sense and there's like zero documentation on it and the people that know about it know like everything about it or there's just like nothing. So there's like this big gap in the middle. So uh, I wrote a blog post here, if you can see this. If, you're, if you have no idea what the Scala presentation compiler is, I highly recommend reading it. It will at least give you like an overview of what it is, how, to, how it's used in different tools and that kind of stuff to hopefully like give you that general information about what it is. 
But in short, it's a version of the compiler that is specifically designed for IDE like tooling. Uh, it's asynchronous, interruptible at every point. It can do targeted type checking and it can stop after a specific point type checking and provide a partial result as well. Um, and what do we use it for? So the Scala presentation compiler for Meadows is used for things like completions, signature help, hover information. Uh, it's a, used as a backup definition provider in, in times when uh, it's not found in semantic DB. Uh, when we do like insert inferred type or we do selection ranges, that's all uh, done by the presentation compiler. And if you're like really curious about like exactly what we use it for, or even how we use it, I highly recommend taking a look at this file, uh, which is in our mtags interfaces. Uh, here, click here. Because this file sort of like defines the contract between how we use the presentation compiler. So like if you look through this uh, uh, class, I, was, I couldn't think of the word class for some reason. If you look through this class here, uh, you'll see all of the methods that we use for stuff, right? So like I mentioned uh, selection range, we use it for selection range. Uh, we use it to insert the inferred type, to implement abstract members, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So like this defines literally everything we do with the presentation compiler. Uh, it defines some of the methods we use to configure and then to manage the lifecycle of the presentation compiler as well. So I personally find it like a really helpful document to understand how Meadows uses the presentation compiler. And there's one of these for Scala 2, and there's also one for actually like one of the benefits of the, and the reason why we do this is we, if you look, I'm in mtags interfaces right now, and this is in Java land. And the reason we do it this way is so then we can have like a defined interface for how we use the presentation compiler across all different versions of Scala without having to do this a whole bunch of different times. So that's why it's in Java, uh, it works really well this way. But then we'll have like an implementation for this in Scala, in Scala, in Scala 2, but then also one in Scala 3 as well. So it's a, it's a, really, uh, it's a really great way to, to get an understanding of what we use the presentation compiler for. We use it for all these things. So when you are on a piece of code, you do hover. The information you're getting is coming from the presentation compiler. That's one way. If you are familiar with like the Scala IDE in Eclipse, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 100% powered by the presentation compiler, basically. The second large thing that you kind of need to know about behind the scenes of how Meadows knows, does stuff is semantic DB. So semantic DB is a data model for semantic information such as symbols and types about programs in Scala and in other languages. Semantic DB decouples production and consumption of semantic information, establishing documented needs for communication between tools. Blah. Yeah, so like that's a little bit wordy, uh, but I highly recommend uh, taking a look at the semantic DB guide on the web website. So again, Semantic DB is a Scala Meta tool. Uh, this does like a really good job of explaining what it is, how to use it, how to read it, all that kind of jazz. So take a look at this. But I think maybe a better way to understand how we're using this and how this works is to just do a little example, a little demo. So let's pretend we have like a very simple application. We just have our build file and SPT related stuff. We have one Scala file. We have this main.scala. That's all it is. And inside of this main.scala, I don't think I show you, but we just have some very simple code, like maybe like a main in a hello world or something, okay? Uh, and if you look at uh, what is produced in Semantic DB for that, it looks something like this. So uh, you can see, I hope you can see if it's not too small, where this is located actually is in your dot bloop directory in the name of your project called Semantic DB example. Uh, then you'll see a couple different directories, right? So like inside of here, you would also see your JSON files that I mentioned before, which correspond to your different build targets. But then you also see this thing called Bloop BSP client classes. You'll also see another one, I think called Bloop BSP internal classes. Uh, there's historical reasons why there's two of them, but we'll just focus on the client classes for now, which is metals as a client in this situation. So then you'll see this long classes, metals, hash type thing, uh, and then the location of these semantic DB files, which correlates to your class path. So inside of here, we have this main.scala semantic DB that was produced for that main.scala file. And we can use a tool called MetaP here, which will give you the semantic DB representation of this file. Um, and you can see what it looks like. If you are newer, or like if you're using like a newer version of Scala, or not a newer version of Scala, sorry, a newer version of Metals, 
another way to do the same exact thing instead of actually having to like dive into your bloop directory, find out where that file is. Another thing you can do if you're using, again, like the snapshot of metals, which will be released next time, you can be in a file like we are here. We just have like a main file and you can do show uh, semantic DB. And there's a few different ones, proto, compact, detailed, and you can click this and then boom, you can see the semantic DB representation of that Scala file, which is kind of cool because yeah, then you can sort of see how, how what everything is being, what's being produced for this specific file, okay? But all that to say, you'll see something like this, which has uh, all the symbols that are in that file, uh, the occurrences that are in that file. Uh, there is actually another thing that should be underneath here, which is synthetics, which uh, is more information on the information that comes from that file. And you can kind of see it already by looking at here, but you start to get the idea that like, oh, interesting. So I can see at what point in the file there are specific uh, occurrences of a specific symbol. So. And you can imagine for all of your Scala files that you have in your project, every one of them is creating one of these files. So then you start to create this system of semantic DB information, which will empower the types of things that you kind of uh, assume, like find references or go to a definition. Those types of navigational features are all being powered by semantic DB because we produce semantic DB for all this stuff. I hope that kind of makes sense. But if you're like me, one of the first questions you'll ask was, wait a second, you said for all of the files that are in your project, right? But then how does navigation work for external sources? Because those aren't on disk. So like, how do you have semantic DB for those? Which is a great question. So we have this thing in Metals called interactive semantic DB. And that is, again, semantic DB that is produced on demand using the presentation compiler. So uh, we have some external sources. We need to navigate to them. So we will give that to the presentation compiler along with some information and extra compiler uh, plugin stuff to produce semantic DB for Scala 2, that is, anyways. And it will spit out the semantic DB that is for uh, those external sources. And then we have information information on how to navigate around and go to those files and to find references in those files and that type of stuff. So if you graph all this stuff out, again, now it gets even more confusing, is we have what we saw before, right? At the top of the file, we have sort of this LSP communication between your client and, and metals. We have BSP communication between metals and your build server. We're using SBT and we, we just are using the default. So then there's also this export process, which like SBT spits out its build definition for Bloop to read it. And then Metal sort of has a direct link down to the presentation compiler because we're using it for things like hover, completions, this jazz. It also has a direct link to semantic DB, which is on disk because during uh, when Bloop has been compiling all of your stuff, it's been producing all of this semantic DB. Uh, and then also we have this sort of data line from the presentation compiler to this in memory semantic DB because it's producing it on the fly for your external sources. Uh, and then Meadows is reading that information as well to ensure that uh, navigation works not just in your code base, but also to your external sources and stuff like this. So a little bit more complicated at this point, but you are starting to see pretty like, I feel like this image does a really good job, hopefully of explaining like the most important parts of metals, just like how do we get your build definition? How do we compile your code? How do we hover? And then how do we jump to like something that you want to jump to? Cause those are like the most common things that you're going to do with metals. So is everybody tracking at this point? Is there any like questions? Cause I'll stop for one second. If there's like specific questions about anything that we've covered so far. If not, we'll move on to a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, not a whole bunch of other stuff, but we'll move on to other stuff because, yeah, we got more to cover. All right. So what about debugging, which is like one of the features that tons of people have always wanted in the past. They wanted to like, they maybe were used to like the level of debugging support that IntelliJ offers and that kind of jazz. So now we have another protocol. So this is called the debug adapter protocol or DAP. And the debug adapter protocol defines the abstract protocol used between development tool, your IDE or editor, uh, and a debugger. And again, this is another Microsoft protocol, uh, which is if you're familiar with like one of these protocols, you end up like kind of getting the idea uh, for others. But this one does differ a little bit. And just to give you like a small example of the flow of this one, because again, it, it differs a little bit from the others. Uh, let's say we're using VS Code 
and you want to start debugging something. So you'll be in VS Code and you'll trigger maybe a key mapping or whatever, and it will send a workspace execute command to metals, and the command it will give it is a metals debug adapter start. Metals goes, all right, cool, let's take a look at the build server. All right, great, this build server supports debugging, so I know how to start it, where it's at, all that jazz. So the name that we are going to try to, to run is example.main. The URI of the debug debugger is located here, so let's shoot this information back to VS Code so VS Code knows what to do with it. So at this point, VS Code knows the location of your debugger, and the debugger knows what you're already trying to do. So then the communication can start basically between your debuggee, which is your client or your editor, and the debugger, which is your build server more, most of the time. And that communication does like flow through metals and metals like does a little extra stuff in between there. But the communication is primarily between the debuggy and the debugger. Uh, and then that, as you're doing things like expression evaluation or finding all the variables in scope for a specific points, all of that information is being handled again back and forth. Uh, and if you want like a little extra information of how that works, like I want to definitely like bring attention to this project, which I believe he's in here, Adrian. Uh, Adrian and Tomek. Uh, have been doing and also Eric as well and told me the other Tomic a whole bunch of people again I don't want to like start listing names so I'll always forget people but they've been doing a tremendous job at this because uh, it used to be only that bloop supported portion of this and that was sort of extracted out of bloop put in here and being it is also being reused for SBT as well because one of the differences when we when a while back was that if you're using bloop you got debug support if you are using SBT as a build server you didn't get debug support that's no longer the case because they share this so like in my opinion uh this is like a dream come true sort of story where like where you're finally getting things that are being shared amongst uh different build tools easily uh, that are providing like wins so like it's no longer just like a win for bloop or a win for spt like if you add something to scala debug adapter it's a win for all the build servers that are using this so like i can't speak enough about like how happy i am that this exists um and it's also like unlocking a whole bunch of extra stuff that didn't uh, work before uh, that you weren't able to do. Like I, I, I like teased out this point by saying expression evaluation, but expression evaluation was something which is actually quite hard in Scala to do, uh, but it will work hopefully in the next release of Metals because it already works right now. Like we could demo it if you really want afterwards, uh, but it works great. There are some hiccups, but it's great work. Uh, so yeah, this is how DAP communication works and this is how debugging works. Um, so if we graph this one out again uh it looks the same as the other graph but now we again have this like dotted line between your clients the debugger uh, the debuggy and the build server the debugger uh which this dap communication is going back and forth um there's also like one more added complexity that's like we don't have to cover at this point but like some of the clients will have uh, dap instrumentation basically baked into the server or sorry into the client so like if you're using vs code you don't have to like install an extra dap extension or something like all the debug stuff that you need uh is sort of just there and built in you don't really have to think about it if you're using something like neovim for example you will need to install something extra like a neovim dap for example uh, which is another plugin that you need which will ensure that neovim can also speak dap so and it works really well so depending on your client that there is, might be some extra steps involved there so that's debugging. All right, some bonus things because we need more protocols and more arrows. What about worksheets, which are like one of my favorite features of metals? Uh, we use MDoc for worksheets. So when you are using uh, just like a standalone worksheet file, so like if I, here, I can give you an example. Like if I just open test.worksheet.sc, so like never opened this before, just like a fresh project, and I do val x equals three. So in this situation, there's no build server involved, there's nothing. It was literally just like you opened a standalone file, uh, Metals will start up in the background, and it will realize you're in a worksheet, and it will do expression evaluation, and it will send the results back. Or at least it should send the results back, because I'm getting nothing back, and I don't know why right now. Anyways, so that should, this should work. We'll skip it for now. So 
Um, we use MDoc for this, and it's just a library basically that we're using. Um, the Scala version that is used, so like in the situation where I just opened up a standalone file, the Scala, like this might be a little bit confusing at times, is that the Scala version that's used uh, defaults to the Scala version that, it, that sort of depends on where it's located. So like in a standalone one, it will default to whatever the default Scala version is in Metals. The next version of Metals will default instead to Scala 3. So like if you open up just a random uh, worksheet like I did here, uh, it will start with Scala 3. And I don't know why this isn't working, so I want to leave this open to see if it's just taking a little bit. Okay, there we go. But uh, so like I have like a snapshot of metals locally, so like that will be evaluated in Scala 3. Um, but if you have a project, for example, which has a Scala 213 and you create a worksheet next to your sources, it will that worksheet will be evaluated in the Scala version that that build target is in. Uh, so like that trips people up sometimes and also the same thing is if you want access to stuff that's in your sources the worksheet actually needs to be next to your next to those sources so you can't like access so I have this project like this worksheet here the root here now you can see it finally works um, and this is being evaluated in Scala 3 um, and you can see that like even though like my doctor shows me that I'm using Scala 212 for this uh, this worksheet is again is evaluated in the Scala three, just because it's at the root of my workspace, it's not located inside of Sanity here, this build target. So if I did move this and put it inside of Sanity, it would be evaluated in 2.12. And then I also don't have access to stuff inside of Sanity unless I move this worksheet inside of Sanity. So again, that trips people up a little bit. Um, okay, so that is worksheets powered by MDoc, which is a great tool. What about Ammonite support? Because we also have Ammonite support. So like I just opened a worksheet, but I could also open like test.sc, for example. And if I did that, it would recognize it as a script. Um, and Metals uses a library by Alex Archambault called Ammonite Runner, which is like a, a much easier way to determine the version of Ammonite and the version of Scala that you're going to run Ammonite with instead of having to like download a whole bunch of different Ammonites or a very specific Ammonite. It just takes care of all of that for you. Uh, but we use it in that situation. And Ammonite is sort of a unique case because when we're editing Ammonite files uh, or just Ammonite scripts, um, Ammonite actually starts as a BSP server as well. So like you'll see a .ammonite directory that will be created and there'll be a bunch of Ammonite specific stuff in there, but it is running as a server. And again, so now the communication that you have is again, you have your LSP communication between your client and Metals and BSP communication between Metals and Ammonite. And then the rest of the graph still basically works the same because it's just treated as a build server. Um, also to note that like Ammonite support right now is only for Scala 2, it's not for Scala 3. And that's why I hesitated to open up test.sc there because if I would have opened it up, it wouldn't have worked because I default to Scala 3. So yeah, it wouldn't have worked there. What about formatting? Because everybody loves formatted code uh, and they don't like to argue about formatting. So in this case, we use Scala format to format your code uh, and we just use it as a library. So again, this still reads from your .scalaformat.com file, which can be used with whatever build tool you're using. You could use it from Scala, uh, Scala CLI uh, or Metals. Uh, we'll all read that same format file. And uh, there's all like it's basically the same exact thing, except if you're using Scala 3, there's a few extra goodies sprinkled in there. Like uh, if you like are updating your project or something and you run formatting for the first time in like a Scala 3 build target, for example, uh, Metals will do a little bit of extra work and recognize like, oh, hey, you're trying to save in this build target, which is Scala 3. Uh, but your Scala format file is not set up to work with Scala 3 sources. Do you want me to add some extra stuff to make sure it will? And then it will actually change your configuration file for you, which is kind of neat how it works. Um, but apart from that, we're just using Scala format as a library. What about organizing my imports? So organizing your imports are done through Scala fix. Uh, so again, same concept applies. It still reads from your .scalafix.conf file, which is awesome because 
Uh, gone is the days where you couldn't support import ordering or that type of stuff in CI because everybody relied on their own editor setup. But instead, uh, you can have a dot scalafix.com file. You could use SPT scalafix, for example, run it in CI or locally, but then also in your editor, when you run organize imports, it will organize your imports. This uses scalafix and it uses a uh, external rule by Lian Cheng, uh, which is Scalafix Organize Imports, which there's actually efforts to inline that to be just a built-in rule right in Scalafix because it's becoming increasingly popular. A lot of people use it and it's incredibly stable. So uh, that's how it works. Uh, there will also probably be more Scalafix integrations coming in the future, hopefully, where some of the other specific rules that you may be able to use with Scalafix could happen and you could get diagnostics, for example, from them here. Uh, like a little fun story was that part of the reason that Metals was actually started, and like if you listen to Tooling Talks, you know this because Olaf mentioned this, but one of the reasons that Metals was even started in the first place was uh, him and Gabriella wanted to see if you could get diagnostics from Scalafix in your editor. And that was sort of like one of the impetuses to starting Metals. We're not quite there yet after many years, but uh, yeah, maybe that will come sometime in the future. Uh, let's talk about another protocol. So what about TVP, which is the TreeView protocol? And the TreeView protocol is an extra protocol specific to metals, which shows various tree views. Um, don't uh, confuse it with like a tree view explorer just for files. It's not the same thing. So don't think, oh, I have, I have my, whatever my tree view is already. I don't need this. It's different. Uh, it's a way for you to navigate external libraries and APIs. So you can, for example, jump to places in your code base from the tree and then vice versa. Uh, just to give you like maybe an example of, of what I mean by that. And let me actually just start this up just to get everything going and then we'll jump back. So we'll go to main. I don't, I think there should still be some external stuff in here. Um, but yeah, and there in some of the clients, there's also like links for you to create an issue uh, or like if you want to do a clean compile, there's some buttons in there. If buttons are your thing, uh, then there's also compilation information that you can see about like what build targets are currently compiling and what percentage are they. Uh, but like if you want to just like see what's in your tree view, you can do this. And like, let's say you want to look at your external libraries. So like this here I have, uh, I don't know, like caffeine because I want to do some caching stuff and I'm trying to figure out what I should be using. So I'm looking at all these methods and, oh, okay, I, I want to know how unsafe works. I want to jump to unsafe. Okay, boom, you can jump to unsafe. And now you're, you jumped from this part of the tree into the actual source code. And again, this uh, will work in clients that have implemented the, the TVP, tree view protocol. Uh, okay. That's pretty much it. So uh, at this point, I'm curious if anybody has questions, if everything made sense, what parts of Metals maybe I didn't cover that you're curious about, or what types of things can I demo that are upcoming maybe, like the like the time, like I have no time limits. So like, I hope that made sense to everybody. Um, yeah, go ask questions if you have any. If not, maybe I'll try to show a few of the upcoming things, which I think are, are kind of exciting. So um, I showed this a little bit earlier. And again, if you have questions, just drop them in chat. But uh, let's say we're in a file like this and you wanted to see the representation of this file in semantic DB or something. You can do that, right? So like we, we did semantic DB and maybe you want to see like the proto rough representation of this. You can, you can do that. Uh, or you want to see like the actual like semantic DB representation, which you can see here. Uh, or you want to go crazy and you want to see like the Java P output. So you can see like the decompiled version, like the verbose or normal one. So like, boom, you can see, and here it recognizes like, oh, there's a trait and there's a class. Which one do you want? Well, maybe I just want the trait. So here it runs Java P and now you can see the full output of this. Um, uh, let me jump to a Scala 3 one because I can't do it in Scala 2 land. But another thing you can do is like apart from all those things that I just showed you, like semantic DB, Java P, uh, in Scala 3 land, you are also have a tasty representation of your file. So you can do the same thing and say, oh, I want to see what the tasty representation for this file looks like. And again, you'll see like, oh, we have a main and a foo. Which one do you want to see? I want to see main and boom. So now you have the entire tasty representation of this file that is available to you right here. And here's the AST.
So it's kind of cool how this works. Um, let me jump back to the Scala 2 land and show you some of the new debugging stuff that uh, they have done a bunch of work in, which I think is pretty pretty rad. So again, we just have like a really simple thing here. And maybe we'll just, at the end of this, just do a print line height. Okay. So uh, let's say you want to run this. And uh, again, I'm using NeoVim DAP here, but I can choose to run this file, which is what I just did. The bottom half of the screen will be my uh, REPL. So hi, you see that it ran. You can do the same thing with tests. Uh, but things that didn't exist before, which is, is pretty rad, is that you can do things like, let's say we want to set a breakpoint right here. And then I want to run this again. And then when I jump down into my uh, REPL down here, uh, you see that it stopped at the line with my list. Now I can just type in, for example, my list, and it will evaluate and will return to you what my, my list is. Uh, you can do expressions as well, like three times three is just should return nine. Uh, and then the coolest thing I think is you can also do like completions even, which blows my mind sort of like, so like if you want to get map here, you can do boom map. Like, so now we have completions that are being available to you right within the DAP REPL for doing expressions, which I think is like super rad. Um, and yep, can't evaluate cause it doesn't make any sense. Um, so this is all stuff that is brand new, which would will be inside of the next release of Metals. Uh, and again, I can't like speak high enough about all the work that went into like the Scala debug adapter repo, which is basically what is powering all of this stuff in here. So that is debugging. What else could I maybe show, um, which is newer? Oh yeah, some other new stuff. And the reason why I have this weird code here in the first place uh, is one of the features that we got for a long time was uh, if you want to know what the type of an expression is at a specific point in an expression, uh, there wasn't a great way to do that, right? So like you can hover, right? And you can see, well, this is a list of int. I know that. If I map over this list, uh, I can see like the entire symbol signature for map. Uh, and then I can see the expression type to understand that this will return a list of short, but it, you sort of lose the whole two double in here. And again, this is sort of like a contrived example because it's, yeah, it's really small and you can sort of just look at it and you can understand what it's doing. But imagine inside of here, you had a whole bunch of different stuff that it was doing. And you kind of wanted to know like at this point, basically like this range, what is the type of the expression? And you can now do that. So like if I start hovering here for the lambdas and, and go to the end of two double uh, and do a hover there, now I can see that the expression type of this is a double. And again, like this is a very like facetious example because it's it's short, but uh, underneath the hood, what's actually happening is it we're saying, hey, like, let's look at this entire range of this expression and let's see what the entire type of that is. And so you can imagine with like code that is much more uh, larger and just there's more stuff going on this becomes really really useful which is another new thing that was that was recently added what's some other things anybody have any questions about like how I can demo something or show that something specifically works in metals I'm trying to think what else we may have added more recently hmm if not I'm pretty sure that is all I wanted to show so I hope that helps like clear up a little bit of information about like how metals works and how the moving pieces are all yeah, moving, I guess. And also like the different options. And actually one thing that I didn't explain super well, maybe that I can uh, just add one more small note to is let's go back to this. Sure. So uh, uh, I mentioned that, uh, can you show the entire type of list map? Yeah, you can. So you can start here. Well, in general, there's two ways to do that. So like in in that situation, in my opinion, it's not that super useful because you can still like um, hover on map and you still get the expression thing, but you can do like a selection through this whole thing like this and do hover. And then you see that it's a list of short. So yes, you can do you can do the you can do that entire you can do multi lanes multi line selections everything. It will work. It will work for all of that. 
Uh, but so in this picture, I mentioned it like way earlier and I forgot to say it is like you can swap things out uh, for other things and it should all work the same. So like you have NeoVim over here, which you can swap for any client that speaks LSP. You have uh, Bloop over here, which in theory you can more or less swap for any build server. So like let's say, for example, you want to do uh, mill bsp which uh, you could try and do you can have basil bsp whatever your build server you're using or a whole other build server that's a, maybe a proprietary one that you have at your company you can you can swap that in and you can use it here as well um and that's pretty much i think the only swapping parts is like you can swap your clients you can swap your build server and it should all work more or less the same so yeah so thanks so much for for coming and hanging out um yeah, always, uh, if you have feedback about any of the stuff that's going on with Meadows, please do drop some comments or drop uh, drop into the Discord channel that we have and ask questions or create feature requests or issues if you come across stuff. Um, there are some, like I'm now thinking, there are some like newer features that we added about like uh, stuff that related to be with significant indentation, but like they actually don't exist in Neovim Meadows just because on type, uh, formatting doesn't exist and that feature is needed in order to make those work um, but if you're a vs code user try those they're actually behind a flag i believe so they're not on by default but but yeah so again huge props to all the people that are working on various tools to make everything work uh, but hopefully this helps clear up the pictures a little bit so uh, thanks a ton for for coming and hanging out and uh, come hang out again sometime in the future when i'm working on stuff